Today we're going to have a fight between different dual band narrow band filters for one shot color cameras on a super fast optical system like my amazing C6 Hyperstar here that images at a focal ratio of f2. Our contestants for today are the IDAS NBZ dual band narrow band filter, the Optolong L Extreme and the Altair Astro dual band narrow band filter. Let's see which does best on a system like this, shall we? Hey guys, Cliff the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to my balcony. Today we're going to be comparing dual band narrow band filters. Uh, first, dual band narrow band filters, they're filters that are made to image emission nebulae like the, or the Great Orion Nebula. And those nebulae, they have very specific frequencies of light or wavelengths at which they, emi they emit some useful signal that we can catch. So the idea is that we can make a filter that blocks all light except the light at exactly those wavelengths. The advantage of that is that we get all of the signal that is useful because we are open for those wavelengths, but we reject a huge amount of light pollution at the same time, which is awesome. And typically, the narrower you can make those filters, the bandpass around the useful signal, the better because the signal is super narrow. So you want to be really as close as possible to it so that you reject as much light pollution as possible. And for most optical systems, it holds true. So uh, 12 nanometer band passes will be less good than seven nanometers, will be less good than five nanometers, will be less good than three nanometers. But things start to get weird with fast systems like this one, the Hyperstar C6 at um, F2, which is super fast. Because the focal ratio, what it also means, it also de determines the maximum angle at which the light rays go towards your camera sensor. And so, of course, on their way to the camera sensor, they will have to pass through those filters that we've built to isolate only those wavelengths that we want from those nebulae. The problem is that the way that those filters are built, they're built by putting tons and tons of layers of materials with slightly different refractive indices. And uh, what happens is that if the light hits the, uh, the filter straight on, it just passes through and um, only for the frequencies that the filter wants to allow to pass through. But once the light comes in at an angle, it has to go through more of that filter. Like the, the layers from the point of view of the light appear to be thicker and that becomes an issue and it causes a problem that we call bandpass shift. Effectively, the bandpass that we're trying to isolate from the nebula that we're trying to image is shifted. So we lose that signal because that signal that we're trying to target, well, our bandpass from our filter shifts away. So the light might actually be completely blocked at those extreme angles of light, such as this on a fast system. And in that case, the narrower the filter, which normally would mean better, might actually be, mean worse because the bandpass like, will more quickly get away from the signal. Now, in effect, that just means that those high angle of incense light rays will get blocked or attenuated by the filter when they shouldn't be. Uh, it doesn't mean that the filters are is useless. You can still get great results. But what is more optimal? Do you need a wider bandpass filter that is less affected by bandpass shift, but lets in more light pollution? Or do you need a filter that is a bit narrower, but lets in so that it's affected more by the bandpass shift, but it lets in less light pollution in the first place. Where is the sweet spot? I don't know, and I want to test that out. So to test that out, I want to do a test that, that's more or less rigorous. And that means that we need to test each of those filters in exactly the same conditions, on the same target, with the same framing, with good focus, and that basically excludes long integration times. Because here in Tokyo, where we have a lot of light pollution, uh, if I image while a target is low on the horizon, I get much worse results than if I image when the target is near the zenith. So it would be unfair for one of the filters. So what I plan to do is to choose a target that is close to the meridian, which is the highest point that the target reaches in the sky, so that its altitude compared to the horizon is pretty much not changing for a certain amount of time. 
during that amount of time I want to take one exposure for each of the, the filters so I'll take one exposure with the L Extreme of probably around 60 seconds and then I'll uh, switch to the um, Altair Astro filter I'll do an autofocus run and I'll take another exposure of one minute and then I'll switch again and I'll do the same thing after an autofocus with the IDAS NBZ filter. And we should be able to compare apples to apples in that case. Now, if I'm able to, I'm actually going to repeat that cycle a couple of times if I can and, and the conditions work well enough for that. And at the end, I'll be comparing the results in PixInsight. Anyway, enough talk, let's get started. As you can tell from the telescope position, we are now on a target that's close to the meridian. We're actually on the Pac-Man Nebula and uh, currently the filter in there is the IDAS NBZ. So, or NBZ, whatever it is. And um, actually I want to, make, to specify that IDAS uh, sent me that filter for free. So IDAS Japan actually contacted me on this, uh, on this filter, which surprised me a lot because <laughs> I was pretty sure I was very much unknown in Japan. <laughs> so that was interesting. Um, and uh, the IDAS filter, because of its 12 nanometer bandpass and bandpass shift characteristic is very popular for Hyperstar and Raza super fast telescope users. But anyway, going forward, I'll take one minute exposure with each of the filter in turn. Okay, we're done with one first run, uh, starting with IDAS, then L Extreme, then Altair. And uh, we'll see what the results are. I'll do a second run so we can average at least two frames of each uh, while the target is close to the meridian. And uh, it's also worth noting that the Altair filter that I just uh, tested um, is uh, advertised as having what is called a, a flat top. And that entails that basically it's less sensitive to bandpass shift caused by fast systems like this one. So we'll see how well it compares to the other two filters um, in that respect. So let me do a second run. I'll do that off camera and then uh, we'll go inside and look at the results. Okay, we're back inside and in the end I did two runs of um, frames. I did three one minute frames, one per filter right before the meridian and I did three five minute frames right after the meridian so we do have a sample with more signal to noise ratio and then I asked my wife to rename the files that were taken to remove the uh, filter name in there so now my file names are a1 b1 and c1 for the one minute exposures and a2 b2 and c2 for the five minute exposures and I have decided to not calibrate them at all. So we can really be sure that there was no noise introduced by the flat calibration in a way that would favor one of the frames over another. So now I'll be doing basically a blind review of the filters to try and find how they work together. Uh, there is an expectation that I have because I have seen videos about the L Extreme not performing well on H-Alpha because H-alpha is actually the bandpass that is the most affected by the bandpass shift compared to oxygen-3. And so I used the Pac-Man Nebula, which is rich in H-alpha. And in this analysis, I'll be um, focusing on H-alpha because it should give us a good characteristic of how the system works. And for the L-Extreme uh, videos, and I also got like a couple of subscribers tell me the same thing, as well as a couple of people on Cloudy Nights, that when they used it with Hyperstar or with the Raza telescope at F2, there was almost no H-alpha going through. The Oxygen 3 was overpowering the H-alpha on some targets, which is not supposed to happen. Normally it's the reverse that happens and they determined it was effectively because the bandpass shift in the H-alpha was closing off their aperture. So I kind of expect the L-Extreme to perform the worst out of all of the filters. I expect the Altair filter to perform the best because it has 7 nanometer bandpasses but it also explicitly markets itself as being good for fast systems. And I expect the IDAS to perform in between the L-Extreme and the Altair uh, because it has um, 
It has, by all accounts, beautiful manufacturing and, and good quality control so that when you buy an IDAS, you know exactly what you're get, getting. But its pen passes are still 12 nanometer. Let's see if uh, that is actually the case. So I am on the computer and I am looking for the moment at one minute exposures. And the only thing that I've done to those frames for now is I've debayered them. And so we have uh, A1, B1, and C1. I do not know which is which. And now, you know, just looking at those pictures, um, and I'll make sure, by the way, to have all of the raw files down in the description so you can do your own analysis and not, and not rely on my own analysis. But one thing that I immediately notice is that B1 here seems to be less good than the others. Because mainly what makes me think that is if you look here around this area here, there's a little blob there, a little blob of nebulosity. And we can see this little blob of nebulosity here as well. However, on the middle filter, it's gone. It's, it's kind of there, but you need to guess for it much more. In a similar way, if I look at um, the picture on the right, this little dark nebulosity here is very sharp and crisp. If I look on A1, it's also quite sharp and crisp. And it becomes much less sharp and crisp here in the middle image. So I'm kind of guessing that maybe the middle image is the L extreme. I don't know, but it's, it definitely seems to be the weaker of the three filters, at least for these one minute exposures. Let's have a look in the red spectrum. So I've extracted the red channel so we can focus exactly on H alpha. Uh, that was captured. And honestly, what I'm seeing just um, confirms that I can see the blob here on the C1 filter. I can see the blob here on the A1 filter. But on the B1 filter, it's like almost invisible. And same thing, the dark nebulosity areas are much more defined in the A1 and in the um, C1. In that respect, maybe the C1 is slightly better than uh, filter A1, uh, but they're very, very similar. They're very, very close. Whereas filter B1 is definitely lower down the chain. Okay, so let's remember that. I'm actually going to write it down that we have uh, B1 at the bottom and then we have A1 and that is very close to C1. Okay, perfect. Let's go now to the five minute exposures. So the instructions that I gave my wife when she renamed these files is that she did not have the f to follow the same conventions for the five minute exposures. So that the A filter in the one minute exposure might have become the C filter, for instance. I don't know. Um, and she might have like played tricks and not <laughs> changed the order. But we're looking now at the five minute exposures and let's have a look at what we see here. So on the RGB 5 minute image, honestly, like from a distance, it looks very similar. But let's not forget that we're looking at the details here because the differences, small difference here, will be a huge difference in a stack. That's why I'm ve being very strict about all of the details that I'm looking at. Now on the color image, I don't see such huge differences between the uh, filters, to be honest. But when I zoom in, I start to see a difference. I start to see that the dark nebulosity here and here, so in both the B2 and the C2 filters, is quite sharp. Whereas on the A2 filter, it's much more diffuse. So it feels like we found the, the black sheep again in the A2 filter. And if I look at the details, I don't know how well YouTube will be able to translate that with the image quality, but I can see this blob here is quite rounded off both in the C2 filter and in the B2 filter here. If I go inside to look at the A2 filter, it looks more triangular in shape. It like, it's, it's less defined. So yes, I definitely feel like we have our black sheep here. Let's go into the actual details. So we look now at the H alpha channels and actually, when I look at those H alpha channels, there's something that jumps to me. Again, I'm not sure whether YouTube will be able to show that, but it is not in the darker areas. It is in the faint nebulosity. If I look at the um, C2 filter here, I can see an area of H alpha nebulosity that's very faint, but I can definitely see it on this filter. 
So C1, uh, C2, sorry, I see it. B2, it's also there. I can see it. Uh, but A2, I, I can't see it. So again, we have two filters that seem to be very close to one another, B2 and C2. And uh, A2 seems to be uh, the black sheep. So let's uh, write so that A2 is inferior to um, B2. And this time I can't really dis like decide a winner uh, between B2 and C2. They really look to be on the same level. Okay, so I think now we can say, um, we can see we have two filters that uh, seem to be um, on par with each other, at least in my tests. And we have one filter that is definitely worse. It's filter B1 for the one minute exposures and filter A2 for the five minute exposures. I will now remove an envelope with the actual matching of the filters. I could also look, look I think, at the FITS uh, file header, um, but that's not as fun. Okay, so what is B1 and A2? Uh, what? Oh wow, talk about, no way. So B1 and A2, the filter that did the worst in this comparison, and remember we're looking at a single frame, small differences will amount to big differences when you start stacking. So the filter that did the worst, noticeably, is the Altair. I did not expect that. I bought the Altair specifically because it adver advertises 7 nanometer band passes, so it's quite tight, and it adver advertises a flat top, meaning it, it says it is very resistant to high um, speed ratios. Oh man, I need to test it on a, a slower system, like F4 to see if it's... That's very disappointing. Uh, okay, and it also means that uh, the two uh, filters that seem to be on par with one another is the IDAS NBZ and the Optolong L Extreme, which is super surprising to me again because I saw that video from Astro Blender where he showed the L Extreme was not working. I've had comments from my subscribers telling me the L Extreme was not working for H Alpha, it wasn't letting H Alpha through on F2 systems. Although I've had other comments from other subscribers that it works great for them. And so I was like expecting the L Extreme to do bad. It didn't. It did just as well as the IDAS. Huh. So based on that, if you have a fast system and you want to do um, dual band, narrow band imaging, uh, which of those filters sh should you choose? Um, based on my results, I can say that for my filters, the filters that I own, both the L Extreme and the IDAS seem to be performing very equivalently. And actually in the one minute exposures, uh, the L Extreme I felt did slightly better than the IDAS. But if I look at comments for some users of the L Extreme that the H Alpha was not working with fast systems, for some samples of the filter, for whatever reason, I have no idea. Then, if I'm really investing money into this and I want to avoid the lottery, I would go for IDAS because they have a reputation of high quality assurance. But that is, I'm so disappointed in Altair. Oh my word, I'm so disappointed in Altair. Why did I, oh, why did I buy that filter? Oh man, okay, yeah. So. It also tells me that um, the L Extreme seems to have definite variability. Was there a bad batch, just like Sharpstar had a bad batch of telescopes? To me, based on what I saw with the Astro Blender video, yes, there was a bad batch. This bad batch doesn't seem to have been advertised in any way, shape, or form. It's the first time I see concrete evidence that Optolong L Extreme filters, depending on the filter, can perform very differently on RASA or very fast systems. Does it, it, it means that potentially there could be another bad batch in the future or even now. The L Extreme is an awesome filter. I love my L Extreme and it seems to be performing very well on my Hyperstar. Will it on yours? I have no idea. I cannot guarantee. So yeah, 
uh, that was surprising. Like I'm, I am very surprised by those results. What I will do going forward is that I will use the NBZ in my Hyperstar and I will reserve the L Extreme for when I image at uh, slower focal ratios with other optical systems. Um, and the Altair will, uh, I'll, I'll get rid of it. Um, that, yeah, disappointing. I'm disappointed, surprised at the results. Huh, very interesting. And with that, that was really the conclusion of the video. Um, I hope this was useful. I'll put all of the raw frames down in the description. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you're new to the channel, you're into astronomy, astrophotography, uh, you may want to consider subscribing down below and clicking that bell icon. I promise you won't regret it. Uh, feel free to leave a comment and also give a like or dislike to the video because it's the only way that the YouTube algorithm really notices the video. Uh, as always, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.